Hello everyone, thank you for checking out this special episode of Really Dicey. This is Manny and I'm here with... My name is Kosala, I'm the founder and CEO of Works Games. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for joining us and today we're going to talk about Jordanheim, a Viking themed role playing game. What, how would you describe um, Jordanheim? Uh, so Jordanheim is a, is a is very much a Viking inspired world and and universe. Uh, we've pulled quite a lot uh, from actual Viking history and mythology, but also added our own flares and changes, alterations. Uh, the the timeline in which Jordanheim is active right now is the timeline where in uh, in let's say human history equivalent of Scandinavian history where the borders between the mainland of Europe and Scandinavia were opening up, Christianity was coming in as a religion, um, um, and pagan religions were challenged. Uh, and it's it's that sort of timeline, but in, in our fantasy world. So you'll see a lot of parallels. There is a, there is a religion called Christianity, spelled with a K, uh, that is spreading throughout the, from, the, from what is the Denmark, which is the kind of center point of the rest of the world, into the, into the different regions. And inside Jordanheim, you've got, we've divided it up into four regions that are similar in, in size, scope, and borders to the current regions of Scandinavia. So you'll have Sveria, which is the equivalent of Sweden, Noria, which is Norway, Suomi, which is Finland, and Denmark, which is, which is modern day Denmark, but in the fantasy world. And these are vastly different um, themed areas because we will be exploring Jordanheim as a universe in, in the rule books and in the tabletop and computer games we build for a long time. So we wanted to give ourselves some breath to to to, to maneuver, and Sveria is kind of where the the middle ground. It's it's where there where there's a very balanced gameplay and and cultural society. It's the way you think of Scandinavia today, except from Viking times. Uh, and Denmark is kind of the modern part of uh, of Jordanheim, where they have embraced multiculturalism they moved away from paganism they've adopted currency and trade there's active flow of culture and knowledge between the mainland uh, areas and and jordanheim and noria is is the very aloof parts of scandinavia that are true to their original roots they i would say the equivalent of the elves in uh, lord of the rings in world if you want quite full of themselves as a society very uh, anti-foreigners and uh, very devoted to their culture and their region and naturally bordered off by a very uh, difficult to climb mountain range between Noria and Sveria. And in Suomi, we have the real old school version of Jordanheim where man, myth, monster are living side by side. Demigods are walking the land uh, and trolls are, are merchants sitting right next to humans in villages trading. And that entire region is completely closed off by a really heavy veil of the shroud. And the shroud is basically our version of a mythological land. And back in the day in the Jordanheim history, the shroud was everywhere, like it is in the Suomi region. But as culture started to grow and humankind started to spread, the magic started to pull away, and now they're less. It's less easy to find the shroud. So that that's kind of the overall concept we're laying out in in Jordanheim as a world. We wanted this to be what we call in the gaming uh, in video games. We call this a mid-core gaming community, the the comfort zone of fantasy role playing that's designed to attract newbies as well as seasoned gamers. And our design philosophy for all kinds of games we do is that there needs to be a, a level of ease for new players coming into the genre to just get cracking. While at the same time, as you start peeling over that ease and digging into the details, you need to have the, the complexity and the depth that the hardcore players are going to want. So we use this philosophy as a design philosophy in everything that we do, whether it's a computer game or a tabletop game. Oh, excellent, excellent, wow. So before we get into the more details about this book, um, I, I know this is closely connected to the, the video game version as well. Anyone um, uh, that wants to know more about works industries, uh, what can you tell us about that? How did the, did the video game come first before the book or vice versa? No, it didn't. Uh, well, it, it kind of depends how you look at it. So the, we are a bit of a weird gaming company in many ways uh, because normally uh, what a game startup and we started about four years ago, would normally do is they they would deploy a game, see if it works, and if it winds up gaining traction, they would then hurriedly build the universe around it. 
Um, we are a very universe dedicated company. There's a lot of problems doing it that way because what happens is you're then suddenly trying to retrofit lore into something you haven't really constructed. Uh, so we we started out with with an immense focus on this view that we would be universe first. We're going to tell the stories first, and the games will come from them. So we spent two years building the universe before we touched either, any of the games. So we we put all the construction around it, the visual side of it, the framework, the the mythology, the history, constructed it all, um, which is a very odd and and dedicated way of doing it. But the the benefit of that is that we, our canon is ironclad. At any given time, when we're building a game in the in, in the universe, whatever type of game it is, it has an, a precise timeline that it exists in. We know what happened in the world before it, after it, during it, and we can tell very canon-centric stories regardless of what we do. So we tie all the content together. So when we develop the games, for example, the video game and the tabletop game, the, the core rulebook started at the same time uh, after the initial universe building was done. And the rules in the core rule books fed into the video game development. And they both deployed into the world at roughly the same time. Uh, and uh, the, the first video game's main character's backstory was told in a web comic and in a motion comic prior to the game coming out. So we tie a lot of complex storytelling together across these different genres and, and, and methods so that, again, a person who wishes to immerse themselves into anything that, you know, deep into what we're doing, you will find the stories if you start browsing around the website, if you look at the games, if you, if you happen to be that kind of player that is going to play the tabletop game, play the video games, read the stories, watch the motion comics, you will see a complete story tie-in across the universe that is all canon aligned. Uh, and normally you need to be a pretty big company to do this. Mm. We are not a big company. We're a very small company. Well, there's only 10 of us so far. Uh, and it's privately financed by me, but because of the fact that we have no intrusion from uh, external forces like investors or venture capitalists and no pressures that are specific about needing to make money at a particular time in order for us to pay salaries or move forward, we've had the benefit of really going, what kind of company do we want to be and how do we get the best case version of that out the door when it comes to our products? So it's a bit of a, a, a luxury situation to be in, which we're, which we're milking to our benefit a great deal because we are taking our time building these products because uh, we can. So that's kind of the overall philosophy of Works Games. Um, so everything is very, built around our unique IPs. We don't work for anybody else's IPs or any, any other companies in partnerships. We, we only do our thing. So a lot of the work does happen in parallel, especially uh, when now we've kind of got a model for how we deploy a universe and we have two new universes announced now that we're going to be working on. But the, the way we do it is that the first video game and the first tabletop core rulebook game for that universe tends to get built in parallel. And then as they feed into it, the rule set starts to take shape. What can someone be in this world exactly? Um, okay, so we've had uh, the, the construction of, of Jordanheim universe, I wanted it to be quite, uh, quite well aligned with actual Scandinavian history. So that caused us a few interesting design uh, challenges we needed to ponder because you, there is a way, uh, you know, tabletop gaming, of course, has exploded. And as a result of that, there's a significant amount of multiculturalism and trend setting coming out of it. Even Dungeons and Dragons has not been immune to this when they when it comes to like bringing the context of game worlds, fantasy game worlds, into modern day diversity and breadth of what we expect in our environments today. That caused a bit of problems with Jordanheim because Scandinavia in the Viking era, that is basically just white people. And it, it, there would have been no reason whatsoever for like a black person or a brown person to be there because that would literally have meant a Saracen from the middle of Europe had walked his way to uh, Scandinavia, which would have been impossible. So in order to stay aligned to this, we were trying to, well, how do we add the complexity of diversity into a game setting like this? So when it comes to what you can be, player characters for the moment are humanoid Viking characters. We, diversity comes from, from culture, not so much from races, but rather from the cultural backgrounds, the positioning, placement of where you are in, in the Jordanheim universe, what the background of that character is, and also what class you're going to play, which is essentially a profession or a, a, a vocation. Um, and, and then we've tried to add the, the, the ability to look at this in a diverse, diversity-rich model 
by not focusing on race race differences, but on types of what defines a hero, because these are basically hero classes. Uh, for example, there is no clear cut view that a hero needs to be good 100% of the time. Uh, you And it's up to the character to define that complexity. They were, you, you can be a, a light finger, which is basically a thief, and still choose to play it as a hero character. There is a hero class uh, that is um, a, is basically a person suffering from very significant mental ill health due to, uh, and it's a magic user class. It's a heavily mentally uh, defected, not defected, but rather a challenged character, but is nonetheless portrayed in the game as a hero class. It's a hero class you can play. And that's how we've added diversity into the mix. So the short answer to the question is that you can pretty much play whatever you want, but there are archetypal vocational classes, eight of them, that will set the groundwork. Uh, but you don't get to play different races. And we will be working on that in the future because as we start now, right now, the Jordanheim core rulebook does loosely touch on the entire Jordanheim world, but focuses on the, the central region of Sveria and Denmark, that gives you the most breadth of gameplay. It's Scandinavia, Viking, as you imagine it to be. The other two areas, we're going to open up into the rules a little bit later down the line, because as, especially when you start entering into Swarmy and you start being able to play monster classes, things can get very varied. So we didn't go down there in the, in the core rule book just yet. We'll leave that to additional books that we've been publishing down the line. Okay, wow. Um, so let's talk about the... the uh the um the combat system uh, what, what can you tell us a little bit about that i noticed that's not your typical d20 yeah. uh rolling system no it isn't we do have a great deal of dice but it but it's not your typical d20 and, and it's uh, the combat system is one of the key things we spend a lot of time working on and so dan cross who is the author of the system of the ordenheim rpg is actually um a freelance uh, rpg developer and he has created a simple uh, a system he calls pliphony uh, we did not inherit directly from Pliphony, but was heavily inspired by it. And one of the core things that it has is speed of execution of things like combat. Because something that I've always uh, had an issue with, with, for example, Dungeons and & Dragons, there's so much complexity in the gameplay that it gets in the way of the narrative. So when you're a game master and you're trying to create free-flowing narrative, and actually if you watch like Critical Role, you can see this happening because the narrative pauses while everyone is doing 15,000 dice rolls, making the right calculations, noting things here, then you don't have that free flowing storytelling. So we wanted to have a system that allowed for pace so that the game master could define the pace of the storytelling and combat didn't drive you to a halt. So in order to do this, there's no such thing called hit points. So when you, you, you pick traits and feats, and as you pick them, they've got defense points associated with them depending on which feats you've assigned yourself and which defense points there you have a total defense pool that's that's basically your hit points and every attacking skill has got an uh, a, a, di a dice associated with it which gives you an attacking pool number which is modified then by whatever traits and and other combinations of enhancements you have at your disposal that you can use whenever you want uh, so, for example, if you're if you're a short sword wielder and your and your and your attack on that short sword is based off a d4, you will roll your d4, add whatever additions you want based on the other skills and enhancements you have, and you've got a number, and that roll is the damage that you do, and the decision to whether you have hit or not hit is basically a question of looking at what the total defense pool against that type of attack is for the for the recipient, and if your attack is larger than your defense pool, then you win. And the difference between your attack and your defense pool gets deducted off that person's defense pool and does not rack up again until the fight is over. So when the person drops to a zero defense pool, he is no longer able to defend and thus is comatose. Oh, so it's wow. a very fast flowing system. So that there's plenty of dice being utilized based on what's being done, but it's a very fast flowing, very fluid system that, uh, that on the face of it is very simple, but you can do a lot of complexity for it. For example, the feats and the traits really add a lot of value. Anyone can do anything similar to how it is in the in the real world. For example, you could go and pick up a bow and shoot it. But if you were to have the archery trait, you would then have a much higher ability to actually shoot it well. But it's not going to stop you from being able to shoot it at all. So it, it works in that in that fashion. So picking your feats, traits, and specialties are absolutely key. 
uh, because the defense to that might be uh, a person, the, the character who's defending against the attack might have no armor to use at the defense pool, but may well have talented into an advanced agility skill and may try to dodge the attack rather than try to try to absorb it. So there's many ways to address any given situation, but all of it is based on the attack pool, defense pool metric. So whenever you've decided what to do, all you need to do is add up some numbers and you get a yay or an A. Okay. I, I noticed that also that there's very interesting, um, um, uh, I guess you could call them classes or occupations. Like I saw the berserker, I saw yep. there's, there's witches and priests. Yep. Uh, what can you tell us more about that? There are. Yeah. Okay, so we do have a uh, we do have kind of the archetypal classes you'd expect from Vikings. The, the berserker is your typical um, Viking that you'd expect to have. He's a he's a, a melee combat class who's all about uh, g getting stuff damaged. Uh, then we've added quite a lot of breath in the other vocations, and especially magic is particularly interesting because magic works very differently from most role playing games. Uh, in the world of Jordanheim, magic can only come to you infused by the gods, and it only is provided to women. Uh, that is the witch class. The reason that it is provided to witches is an, is an ecological balance question. Because in the, in the world of Jordanheim, the communication between the gods and monsters and the, the shroud world and the real world is done by witches. They're essentially the keepers of the balance, similar to druids, for example. And they are selected by the gods to be bestowed with that power. And as your character levels up from level one to onwards as you adventure, gaining spells is a role playing exercise so it's up to you and the, as the character and the game master to decide when your actions in the world ha have made you worthy of an increased understanding of your of your spells and then you need to pray to the gods to be bestowed with the spell so it's a very different model from every other uh, rpg out there uh, and once you've got the spell you can then use it as often as you want based on your magical skill sets uh, so that so the, the the witch will be the equivalent of the mage class but with, with significant differences. Then there are some caveated variants. There's a specialist cast called the rune caster. The rune caster is a person who has the ability to channel the magic, but is not able to cast spells. He just understands the magic, the shroud, the seder, as we call it in the, in the world, in order to be able to channel magic into objects. So he can enhance objects, empower objects, create permanent enchantments like a magical lock on a door. Uh, and rune casters can be can be male characters. Uh, they don't channel the magic directly. They just have a deep understanding of it that can be converted into an object. Um, and then the uh, the press tour is actually a devotee of the Christian god. Uh, and he gets his spells directly from the from the Christian God and is the equivalent of a cleric, if you will, in D and D. Uh, so there, there's all of these different um, classes that you can that you can play. And uh, the 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 character I spoke of, who the the mad character that you can choose to play, is actually a male character who is accidentally bestowed with magic. And uh, because it's not part of the natural balance, it drives the person mad over time. And it is the equivalent of a wild form of magic. And there, there are certain uh, legendary characters in the world who, have, who are male characters who have managed to master the magic, despite it being something that would normally have driven a lesser person completely mad. Uh, and it is, a, a, it is a very specific class choice to play that class. Um, and because you'd have to un you'd have to have a, a bit of a role playing uh, moment of, of defining how you would have been bestowed the magic. So, for example, you you may have been born for, uh, uh, with a mother who was a very advanced witch, uh, who in the childbirth of itself accidentally bestowed the character with the gift, and it was not directly bestowed by a god. And th those kind of accidents create these these crazy mad mad characters that can be very interesting role playing uh, events to play in any party. Uh, but essentially, the further he gets, the more powerful he gets, the crazier he gets, the more less control he has over his magic, and it can have disastrous but very powerful results. Let's talk about the the uh, horrors of the world, the uh, the monsters that are in this setting. Uh, what can you yeah. tell us about them? Uh, so depending on whether you are in the shroud or outside the shroud, uh, the 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 adversaries you you would meet uh, differ greatly. So outside of the shroud, you are talking about the normal uh, kind of things you'd expect in a Nordic environment. You'll have the wolves, the bears. You'll have different clans of of uh, of humans and other other tribes that are that will be your your adversarial points in that in that region. 
Once you enter the shroud, however, then things get a great deal wilder. Uh, and everything from very large versions of traditional uh, creatures like wolf spiders to, to um, magical monsters that are demons and creations of, of uh, demigods and gods all start popping up. Uh, and uh, again, there we've allowed for a great deal of uh, freedom for the game master to craft the way he wants. You could, for example, have magical abilities, spells in such characters, because it's possible for a monster to have been bestowed that power by the demigod that created it. Uh, and because the Viking mythology, and this is something that's somewhat lesser known, is we know about the main ones in the, the main gods of Viking mythology, but actually there's a really rich demigod culture in Viking mythology, there's literally hundreds of them. And, and therefore you have an enormous amount of depth and variety you can create inside the Shroud. So there we've given in the book, the, the core rule book specifically does not have a large amount of examples of monsters, items, and spells. We have given a basic understanding, a format, and, and, a, and a framework for how to create them, and then left them up to the game master to do it the way that works for him. Of course, that's not going to necessarily be very great help to a novice game master. So the third book in the in the the, the, the core rule book is actually a three book series, and the third book is the equivalent of a monster manual and a spell compendium combined. Uh, which we're going to do a little bit late in the timeline because we kind of want to have the initial people who adopt this game have, you know, not be hemmed in by too many rules and limitations there just to see what they can do uh, and they want to do with the game. And then we'll eventually come up with a compendium of ready-made monsters and spells that you can just insert. We have, in our in modern culture today, we just have, uh, we just recently, uh, Marvel has recently wrapped up their Loki TV series. We also have um, other uh, Norse mythology video games like um, Assassin's Creed, the recent Assassin's Creed also has, it's also based on that. Um, what is it about our culture today that is so fascinated with Norse mythology or with, with Vikings? What is it about that that you think uh, entrances us? Very, very, very interesting question. I'll tell you a funny story. When we originally conceived of Jordanheim, nobody was doing anything in Vikings. Because uh, it was about four or five years ago, and we were originally thinking about it for the... Uh, I was sitting there with my writer, uh, whose name, by the way, is Thor, for just, just his real name is Thor. Uh, and back in the day, Thor is no longer with us, but he was with us in the first year. We were, we were looking at the kind of universes that we want, you know, what, what would be the first one? Because I, I already had three universes in mind before we even got started. It's like, which one are we going to work on first? So I am actually Swedish by naturalization. So, and I, I'm, I'm a big mythology buff anyway, and I enjoy the mythology of, of, of the Viking culture anyway. And we were thinking, we knew we were gonna do a computer game and uh, a tabletop RPG. So like, and we also needed to stand out, we needed to be different. So we were thinking about what hasn't been done before. And actually at the time we started four years ago, there was no Viking games out. There's maybe a handful, you know, one or two there. And we thought, yes, this is great, let's do this. And then as we were, it took us about three years to get the first, you know, tabletop game, the first PC game out. <laughs> In that time, Vikings absolutely exploded. So to be honest, even I do not know where this enormous popularity came from, because when we started, it wasn't popular. We were under the impression we were going to do some very niche work here. Uh, but then by the time the game came out, there, there were Viking PC games coming out of the woodwork. And the Viking series had rolled out and Marvel was all over Viking stuff. And we're like, oh, okay, that's great. Because uh, we, we were in, initially thinking we might have to get people to understand why this mythology is cool and why we wanted to do it. But the, the, the pop culture kind of assisted us with that in an amazing way. But it was purely accidental. I, 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 do, I do not myself know where this immense um, popularity blew up from. Hmm. Hmm. Well, so for anyone that wants to know more about, about your game, whether it be the, the core rule book or even the, the video games, I'm, I'm intrigued to check out your site after this interview. Um, where can people yeah. find, find more of this? Yes, well, you can find, uh, well, the best place to start is the Works Games website. Um, and then we also have a dedicated website for Jordanheim, uh, which will give you a lot of information at the top level about the world and the universe itself. Um, so you, before you even gotten around to, you know, even buying the book or any of the games, there's a lot of free information that tells you a lot about the world. Uh, and we also have a bunch of uh, assistive tools like character sheets and material. We're about to launch a completely free adventure module in a month. 
that will get you started in the world. So I think the best starting points are the Works Games website and the, and the uh, Jordan High website. And as you start to embrace the material we have there and the curiosity has reached a level beyond just the general uh, understanding and you want more, uh, that would be a good time to dip into the PC game, the YouTube channel, which contains a lot of video content covering the universe, the games and the world. And then the core rule book, which as I said, is one of three books we're developing. So the second one is actually the world book which is an entire book dedicated to nothing but the world. The core rule book is kind of a, a little bit of everything across 140 pages that gives you a single book that you can buy that is all you need and will ever need to play games in the Jordanheim world. And then after that, if you're looking for more, then you will acquire the other books in the series and the additional work that we're building around it. And just to be clear, is this uh, available uh, PDF and, and in print? That's so the PDF book. version is available uh, everywhere. You can buy the soft cover version from Amazon in the US. The hard cover version will be sold from our website uh, probably around about towards the autumn and onwards uh, because we're currently not offering a print on demand, but we will. Um, and we've picked our print on demand supplier. I've, I've actually got a couple of editions of the hardcover book here with me. So I, I, I know what quality is coming out of this. Uh, we've opted to go for a relatively expensive but very premium level hardcover uh, and it will be available as print on demand from the work store um, and the work store is, is our own store where we sell both our products along with that with an, a whole bunch of other great independent creators who are also selling their products on the store. Awesome. Well, thank you sir, for taking the time to talk to us about this book and I'll put everything, uh, all the information in the description below and um, to our viewers out there, I hope you enjoyed this. Have a great day, get your shots, and be safe out there.